that be, can everyone see my, my screen? We can. Okay. You just have to and start the slideshow. Th this will be very brief. There's only 120 slides that we'll review. And <laughs> there'll be a quiz Sorry, Seriously, you said there were 65 last night. I no, told him he wasn't allowed to do that many. Well, I'm, I'm very proud and honored to uh, be speaking to everyone today. And uh, as Jermaine mentioned, uh, this is a very truncated version of the presentation that we usually give. So hopefully it'll allow you to have more um, uh, Q&A time. Uh, so I am um, actually an ophthalmologist uh, who is, in uh, addition to being in private practice, also uh, have an ac academic affiliation with George Washington University. And my area of uh, specialty is vitreoretinal surgery, uh, but we end up managing and dealing with a lot of glaucoma. So I will be uh, presenting that particularly today. So. Uh, just a quick uh, explanation diagram of the eye, the human eye. I, I, some of you are familiar with these things. Um, this is a cross-section area. Keep, uh, you know, uh, specific uh, uh, focus on the optic nerve. You can see my mouse moving on the screen. Yeah, okay. And the anterior portion. So if you imagine the eyeball like a, a, the earth, there's an equator which is the greatest diameter, and there's the posterior segment, anterior segment. So in NPS, we're going to be addressing actually uh, issues that affect both anterior and posterior segment. Um, so this is a uh, cross-sectional area of the front part of the eye. You can see the cornea here, and this is the iris, the colored part, and behind it is the lens, which in all of us will become a cataract. The key thing to remember in this diagram is that you see this meshwork. There's uh, a water pressure that your eye and uh, my eye has to keep inflated, just like a soccer ball, except instead of air, it's water. These structures here that look like udders, called the ciliary body, drop a uh, drop of clear water into the back of the eye every few seconds. It circulates in the back of the eye, goes through the pupil, and drains at these grates called the meshwork. And if you have a blockage of this meshwork, the pressure rises in the eye and it starts to cause some problem. Here's an illustration of what we call aqueous or the water flow uh, that is generated by the ciliary body, it goes again through the pupil and out this meshwork. So this is important to keep in mind when we talk about management of this condition. When you or I go to uh, have our eyes examined and uh, the doctor picks up uh, her ophthalmoscope and looks inside, uh, they look at the optic nerve and among the other structures. And one of the key indices to remember is that if with high pressure, as can happen in, block, in uh, MPS, the, there is a cupping, we call it cupping. So if you imagine the optic nerve as it enters the eye, is like a donut. So if you divide the inner diameter of the donut by the outer one, and if it's more than a two to one ratio, then that's one strike. Doesn't mean you have glaucoma, but that is suspicious for it. So what are the ocular findings in MPS? I'm not going to go through this uh, list as we have in the past. The most important thing is the glaucoma, because that is the one issue that can obviously permanently affect vision. This is a cross section of that optic, of a normal optic nerve. It's stained, this is from a, path a pathology specimen as it comes into the eye. So this, this kind of bluish purple structure is the actual nerve. The, the very dark blue is the white part or the sclera of the eye. Now that is normal, okay? Now look at this. This is a very cupped optic nerve. This is from a different patient and different staining, but it shows what we call this invagination. And the best example I can give you folks is if you remember a beach ball, you know, the standard little cheap beach balls that have multi different colors and you blow it up. And after you blow it up, you close the valve and you pop it in so it doesn't stick out while you play with it. If the pressure is too high, you cannot put that valve back in because it pops. Why? Because that's the weakest spot in the entire wall of the balloon. So similarly, you can think of the eyeball itself as the optic nerve when it enters is the weakest area. So if you have high pressure in the eye, over time, 
it slowly crushes and squeezes out these one and a half million tiny little nerve fibers that are essentially the video cable connecting the eye to the brain. And here's an example of a prominent cupping. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that the patient has glaucoma, but this is prominent cupping. So if you look at, this is the right eye and this is the left eye, the right eye, the, here's the outer diameter of the optic nerve and here's the inner diameter of the optic nerve. So how does that translate practically or uh, symptomatically in a patient? So this is, you can tell, this is not a very recent photo, <laughs> but let's just say that's the normal vision out of one eye of a patient. As glaucoma develops, they start getting tunnel vision and slowly but surely it starts to close in. So you can have patients who have 20-20 vision as they're measured in the doctor's office, yet their visual field has been almost uh, wiped out. You're going to look for, that's all. So the classification for a glaucoma, uh, again, we won't go into the details. There's different types of glaucoma. Just remember, they, they divide into open angle and closed or narrow angle. And that goes back to that diagram uh, it, uh, that I showed earlier. If the meshwork is exposed and is open, or if it's narrow where the iris, the color part, is kind of jamming or plugging it up, uh, that is a different type of glaucoma. The majority, vast majority of NPS glaucoma is the open angle type. And this is just to start to uh, illustrate uh, the work of uh, two key folks in NPS and glaucoma. And it shows on the, on the x-axis the different types of glaucoma uh, and their incidence. And these are from two studies. But you can see that primary open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. In other words, you can have situations where the pressure is high in the eye, but they don't have the full-blown uh, glaucoma, and I'll, I'll explain that in a sec, it can be just or over 40% by some of the trials. So it's not an insignificant factor in NPS. So how is glaucoma assessed? Very simple. Elevated pressure in the eye, the normal pressure is 10 to 22 millimeters mercury, but you can have people with, quote, normal pressures that still develop glaucoma. But generally speaking, an elevated eye pressure is one factor. Cupping of the optic nerve, which are reviewed, and abnormal visual fields. Okay, most of you have had this test where you put your chin in a big bowl and press a button to map out your side vision. And that's what the first areas that go in glaucoma. And loss of nerve fiber layer. Again, it, that's also a more sensitive method of assessing uh, glaucoma. Now, if you only have one out of these four findings, regardless of which one, you are termed a glaucoma suspect. And some of you may have received this diagnosis where maybe your pressure is like say 21, 22, but everything else is normal. The, the, the optic nerve looks normal. There's no visual field deficit and the nerve, uh, nerve fiber layer is normal. Um, and vice versa, you could have normal pressure and prominent cups and you would still be called a glaucoma suspect. And there's hundreds of millions of people in the world that are glaucoma suspects that never get glaucoma. But the key thing, as you will know, is the follow-up. And I think Adele mentioned that as well. So it's very critical that you do follow up on these things. So here's an example of a tonometer. This is one way of checking the pressure. And uh, an ophthalmologist uh, does that. Uh, and then another method is using a special lens in front of the same device, the slit lamp, and examining the interior of the eye to actually look at the optic nerve in three dimensions. And obviously it's photo photographed as well for record keeping. And then visual field testing. You remember I mentioned to you, there's several devices that are able to test the side vision. And so this is an integral part of your exam uh, for ophthalmology and it can be automated as well. And this is the type of printout. Uh, there's different ways of printing this out, of course, but this shows you um, uh, bit by bit where the visual field deficits are, and this can be tabulated for later uh, comparisons. The final thing is the OCT, optical coherence tomography. It's think of it like a CAT scan for the nerve and the retina. And uh, thankfully, these devices have been around for 15 years at least. And uh, um, actually, sorry, longer than that, uh, th almost 30 years. And they're very, very uh, sensitive at picking up changes before 
the other tests show abnormalities. And typically they can image the optic nerve kind of just like the pathological specimens I showed you. So they can calculate the cup and disc cup to disc ratio. And also they measure the nerve fiber layer, which this is the right and left eye of a patient. And it's normal because the black line is in the green zone. So these are things that you should be getting at least annually. So in terms of follow-up, again, this is a rule of thumb for uh, NPS patients. Uh, it can be anywhere from two to four times a year to assess pressure and other things. The nerve fiber layer analysis that's done with the OCT, again, every four to two to 12 months, depending on the findings. And the visual field testing is the same, four to 12 months. Uh, the general management is the ophthalmologist uh, will set a target pressure and they could, let's just say, for example, they pick 16. It is then everything is done to make sure that the eye pressure does not go higher than that. And it's not an absolute value. So after a year, they could find, they could uh, repeat the test and say, okay, this, uh, we are seeing some slight loss on the visual field. Therefore, we're going to set a new target pressure, lower one, 14. And so there's several factors that the uh, clinician will use to make that assessment. Now, in terms of therapy, uh, the general approach to glaucoma in general is we start with drops, medications. And thankfully, there's a lot of effective drops uh, that are available now. And if the drops don't seem to work, the next thing is laser trabeculoplasty. If you remember that little mesh work I was, uh, showed you in the uh, anatomy slide, if the uh, grate is clogged, the drain grate is clogged, the laser can uh, start to make holes in it to allow the fluid to leave, and that's the use. Trabeculectomy and these other three are surgery, the last three, the aqueous uh, implants and the cyclodestructive procedures are really um, uh, used for tough cases that don't respond to the first two. Uh, in the case of surgical, I mentioned the laser that's done typically in the office. Other things like filtering surgery and aqueous drainage implants, they've made some significant strides, by the way, are done typically in the operating room as well as cyclodestructive procedures. Uh, some of these implants they're actually trying to have as an office-based procedure, and you can see how these small little stents that can be inserted can also control the pressure and lower the risk for glaucoma. Uh, these are just some uh, slides to illustrate the different uh, ways that can be lowered. This is to illustrate the uh, laser trabeculoplasty, and this is the area where the laser is opening the holes to allow drainage. Uh, the other techniques are to, if you can't open the drain, uh, you can turn off, turn the pump down, and by destroying selectively certain uh, portions of the pump, you can reduce the pressure. Again, this is reserved mostly for uh, more advanced glaucoma. And finally, the uh, implants, uh, there's a huge host of different types of implants that can act like reservoirs, allowing the pressure to stay permanently low. Uh, and again, these are reserved for more advanced. And that's it, folks.